come to this second chapter in this remarkable epistle. And it is concerning the signs of the end. And the apostle begins by beseeching the people, the Thessalonians, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, or as we might say today, in connection with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in connection with our gathering together unto him. That will be the subject of the following verses. Two matters of great concern, closely linked, of course. But the apostle adopts a, a very kindly tone as he speaks of these things. Now we beseech you, implore you, appeal to you. Brethren, my brethren, you might say, though he has the authority to uh, speaking from God, to command them with regard to what to believe, what to understand, yet he deals most graciously with this subject. We implore you, brothers and sisters, in connection with the coming of Christ. He taught them about this already, he tells us, shortly. But things were going wrong. His teaching had been uh, misunderstood, or perhaps deliberately, for all we know, by some, uh, stretched and amplified in the wrong direction. And so there was confusion. We implore you, in connection with the, first the coming of Christ, the Lord's return. He had taught them, it's all in the first letter to the Thessalonians, it's referred to. He had taught them about the coming of Christ and about the gathering together of the saints, of the redeemed who would be still living on earth, in the skies, and yet what they're now being given to understand by mistaken teachers or their own misunderstanding was that no, Christ would return without such a gathering together. So he introduces the subject concerning the return of Christ and especially in connection with the events that have been described to you already, the gathering together in the skies. Verse two, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. It's very vivid the language here, rather like a, a vessel being shaken about in a great storm at sea, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, pained by any means, not by somebody claiming to be speaking by the Holy Spirit, nor by word, that is someone saying, I have heard the apostle say this or that, nor by letter. There were forged letters passing. People who would forge letters from apostles claiming authority by them. Nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Either that it's come or that it's very, very imminent, that it's almost beginning to take place now. That cannot be so, the apostle tells them, because there are certain signs of the end that must come first, certain developments, and then will follow his remarkable teaching about the man of sin and so on. And it has been said that what follows in chapter 2 is largely original with the Apostle Paul, that you don't find it anywhere else in the Bible. And cynics and doubters of divine inspiration say this is, this is entirely different, entirely out of line with what anyone may have expected up until this point, a new development, a new theory. Well, of course, people who say that kind of thing simply don't know their Bibles. We could spend time this morning, but it's not going to be our purpose, turning, for example, uh, to the book of Daniel, chapter 7 
and chapter 8, where many things about the return, the final coming of Messiah are mentioned, end time characteristics. And the very interesting thing is that the language of the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians and what we call chapter 2, his language doesn't quote, but it echoes very closely many of the things that you read in those 7th and 8th chapters of Daniel. It's, uh, in a sense, a commentary on them, an explanation of them. It echoes and reflects those very words. The apostle, as he frames his language, he doesn't quote, he doesn't exactly copy, but he follows very much the same ideas and the same thoughts. Of course, he's inspired by God. And what Daniel is given in his prophecies, and then you'll remember Daniel was told, seal it up, seal it up to the end as if to say, this cannot be understood until the last age. This will not be intelligible until the very end of time. Now, by the Holy Spirit, the end of time has arrived, the last age, the gospel age, the Apostle Paul begins to open up the book of Daniel and the ancient prophecies to us. You could say, there's nothing original here, there's nothing that doesn't echo what has been said before in more mysterious language because it wasn't time for its clear unfolding and understanding. But I mention that just as we begin. But i like to go to verse 3 and talk about the two preceding events. This is strictly our first heading, two events that precede the coming of Christ. Let no man deceive you by any means. And then in italics, that day shall not come, but it helps us, it's necessary. It isn't in the Greek, but it's vital for understanding. It's, it's what we're talking about. That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. So, there are going to be two events that precede the coming of Christ that Paul is inspired to particularly mention. There are some details which he doesn't mention, which are unfolded elsewhere, say in the book of Revelation, and even alluded to in the first letter to the Thessalonians. But he's going to stick to two basic points. That'll be enough for the present teaching. That day shall not come, except there come first a falling away, and second, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So first then, a falling away. The apostle is concerned that the Thessalonians understand this. They've, their basic misunderstanding is that they have thought that uh, a sudden return of Christ meant an imminent return of Christ. That was their mistake. Oh yes, Christ would come suddenly, but that didn't mean soon. Things were to unfold first, as the apostle will show them. And here they are, the falling away, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So there'll be a great apostasy. That's right from the Greek word, apostasy, a falling away. When you think of this apostasy, think of uh, not simply people fading, in their Christian belief, or losing heart, or drifting away. Think of divorce in the world, that is. Think of a complete breach with great animosity and opposition. That's all implied in apostasy. 
there'll be an apostasy first. Now, as we're told in uh, 1 John, the things of the end, the things of Antichrist, even this apostasy, they are happening even in Bible times. In a sense, there's something continuous about this. In every period of the Gospel age, from the very beginning of the church, there is a measure of falling away, an opposition. We're well aware of that. In the Apostles' day, the main people who fell away, the first uh, people, were the Judaizers. And you read so much about them in the epistles. When the apostle would go round evangelizing and churches would form, hot on his heels were false teachers who came out of Jerusalem, following him round and then trying to get into these new churches and tell them, no, 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 you cannot be saved by only belief in Christ. You've got to adopt Judaism as well and keep the law. The Judaizers, and they were an enormous trouble to the young church. And then, just as the age of Revelation ends and the New Testament is virtually complete, and into the first phase afterwards come the Gnostics. I'm not going to go into the details. And then there were various others, but things that you know about, by about the 6th century, you get the deviation and falling away, which leads to the Church of Rome, with all its uh, vital errors and opposition to crucial salvation doctrines. And then after that, you come right up to more modern times, the 19th century, I leave a lot out, you have theological liberalism and unbelief which has infected all the denominations, Christian denominations in our country and brought them all to their knees. And now you've got the last stage, rank atheism. Up till now, all the deviation, all the apostasy has been to pervert and to change religion and to bring in false doctrine. But the crowning mark of Satan is to no longer pervert religion and false doc bring in false doctrine, but to bring in rank atheism. Now we're at the beginning of the process, maybe well advanced along the process. Hostility and atheism is in today. So there always is falling away represented, but this is what the apostle means, just before the coming of Christ, at the very end of the last age, the last age is now, from the first coming of Christ to the second, the gospel age, the church age, that is all described in the New Testament as the last age. But at the end of the last age, this apostasy will be, reach its climax, and it will become so pronounced and so extreme. And that's what the apostle is referring to here. Except there come a falling away first. Well, we see the falling away, but it's going to reach a, reach a pitch, a peak. And at the same time, then that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. I don't see much about son of perdition. For our purposes, it just means here he's the son of destruction. He's made to be destroyed. He's incorrigible, unsavable. He's the man of sin, the Antichrist. Oh, there are Antichrists here already. All the lesser Antichrists, but the Antichrist will be the man of sin. When we say the man of sin, think in terms of the man of lawlessness. That's literally it. The man who is anti-law, anti-moral law, 
anti-divine law, anti-order, that man of lawlessness be revealed. Is he a person? Well, he could be a person, he could be a movement, but if he's a movement, there will be a figurehead, because the way the apostle speaks throughout this passage, the man of sin is assumed to be a literal man. So if we're to see the man of sin, which I think is very likely and possible as really a movement, still at the very end, there'll be a figurehead, a leader, a major figure representing that movement. The man of sin be revealed. A movement would be something like communism, but it isn't that, because that's peaked and passed in the old Soviet Union, still in China, but it no longer looks to be the world possessing force that it once aspired to be. And also it doesn't match the Antichrist in all respects, but something like that. More likely today, but I only suggest this, it could be the great movement of scientific humanism, which is getting into every country in the world. Ultra-rationalism, the abolition of God, invading and possessing the minds of people. That would answer the characteristics of this passage, and a figurehead would emerge in that movement. There are figureheads of a kind now, certain famous names who seem to be the big names of militant scientific humanism. But there's perhaps going to be one who transcends all those present names, who gathers together the entire movement. The man of sin or lawlessness. So let's look at the aims of the man of sin just for a moment. This movement, can you imagine scientific humanism as a movement combining with all the forces of LGBT and moral lawlessness, all coming together into one great massive orchestrated anti-Christian campaign? You can well imagine that at the moment. Of course, we have to be careful because 30 years ago, people could read all this into communism. But we can well imagine all a great orchestrated scheme to seize and rape and possess and dominate the minds of men and women. The aims of the man of sin. Verse 4, who opposeth, opposeth Christ and the Lord, more than despises, doesn't just say he despises the Christian message, he opposes it. Why, back in the 6th, 7th centuries when Rome began to develop, it didn't despise the name of God, it twisted the doctrines, it perverted Christianity to its own wishes, it ruined the possibility of salvation for its adherents. But this is different. This would fit scientific humanism. It opposes bitterly and attacks and hates the things of Christ and the church. And it'll get worse, worse than we see today. He opposes, vehemently attacks we see the opening salvos now, but we don't see the climax just yet. We see it everywhere. I was thinking the other day, I read at the end of World War II, when uh, the surrender of the enemy was declared, 
the Prime Minister of the day, Winston Churchill, led the entire House of Commons, all the MPs, just across the road to St Margaret's Westminster, which is technically the church of the House of Commons, for a service of thanksgiving. Can you imagine such a thing today? The name of God is unmentionable today. See how things go hurtle downhill and we move from the time when those people may not all have been believers, but they were ready to respect. Why we noticed that uh, years and years ago, our politicians would not be ashamed to name God and use religious terms. Then we noticed that was abandoned in our country. We noticed that American presidents still ended their speeches with God bless America, but such a thing was unheard of anymore in Britain. You see how it moves? Now the Americans have caught up. And increasingly, religion and God and Christ is being unmentionable there in the smart circles and the ruling circles. Now in our country, you were to bring the name of God into things, people will literally begin to bristle in opposition and resentment and hatred. You see the movement? It's all in the book of God. It's all in prophecy. It's all rehearsed here by the Apostle Paul who opposeth. We see all the signs of opposition and the climax is soon to be reached. Nowadays, we have to put up with hearing Christianity attacked on every hand as myths and lies. And now people who stand for moral truth are being increasingly criminalized. Now we hear a new definition of British values British values, apparently, is the upholding of the breaking of God's moral law, enshrined in law, and increasingly now enforced. Who opposeth, we see it all developing, and exalteth himself, the supreme height of human arrogance, exalteth himself. We see it. We're taught on every hand. The children are taught in the schools now. Man is not evil. Ha <laughs> ha, there was a time when people followed teachers like Augustine and his theory of sin. Well, it wasn't his theory of sin. It was right out of the Bible. Talked about depravity and the fall and man being sinful by nature, away with all that, everybody's good at heart. The new way, there are no binding moral standards delivered to us by God. It's up to us to write the creed that suits us, that works best in our society. We've been prevented from doing things that are enjoyable and that we want to do for too long. Away with all those biblical moral standards. Man exalts himself. I know best. There is nobody above me. I am my own God. I can write my own standards and do it the way I determine and decide. I'm not fallen. I'm not evil. I have authority. I have knowledge. I have liberty to do what I like. He is God in his own eyes, no one else to give account to, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. It doesn't mean he's going to be the Pope or the chief religionist. It means he's above God. He's done away with God. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. That means literally man has taken the place of God for himself. 
we see that being reached in our own time. He's so domineering, man. In our country, for something like three years now, the teaching of creation, or even intelligent design, has become illegal in the public schools. Many people haven't woken up to that. It is actually illegal. It's, it's an offence to teach these things in our land. It's verse 4, becoming fulfilled in our eyes. All the students at university who this year are reading biological sciences will have their reading lists so carefully screened that they will not read one scholar, not one, who has any objections to the theory of evolution. They're not allowed to. They don't know it. They're programmed to think, oh, I, I don't believe in religion. I am free of that. They don't realize they're actually captive to a highly policed curriculum, an agenda in which God is entirely removed. And it doesn't matter how eminent the writer, the scientist may be, any book, any observation, any comment which casts the slightest doubt on materialism is not allowed. That's the domineering arrogance of scientific humanism. Do you remember last summer? Or was it the summer before? I'm not sure. Time flies. But suddenly we got Professor Richard Dawkins and his views against uh, holidays for Christians, holiday camps and, and conferences for children. Ah, oh, it was dubbed as brainwashing. It should be made illegal. Well, it hasn't happened yet, but it will, because this is a domineering manner of scientific humanism. They want to do away. They can't bear the thought that there'll be 50, 100 young people gathered together, maybe under canvas or somewhere else, and they're having a holiday, and in the course of that holiday, somebody is opening the Bible and teaching them about God. Ban it. Do away with it. It's, it's oppressive. Nobody votes for this, but they get their way. In the end, they're domineering. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God and he opposes and he exalteth himself. You look at any uh, program on the television which has to do with natural life and the presenters are so evolutionary and anti-God, anti-creation. Any term to replace God. Nature does this. Nature does that. You mustn't mention God. You hate him. You're against him. We see it all forming. But anyway, I must pass on to another verse. It'll reach its climax. Verse 5, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, what holds back, the man of sin from emerging, the climax, the last stage. Ye know what withholding. Paul had told them. He doesn't tell us. He told them, but he doesn't tell us. That's a mystery. Why were the Thessalonians able to know something? Who holds back the man of sin that we're not told? Well, I'll tell you what I think the answer is. The answer is, we don't need to be told. It is so obvious. Only God holds back the man of sin. But let's look at the details. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 
the mystery of iniquity. This is astonishing. Why does the apostle call it the mystery of iniquity? All that I've been describing, that's what he means. The apostasy, the great rundown, the constant challenging of the truth, coming to a climax at the end of time. Why is it a mystery? It's not a mystery to us. He's explained it. We can see it clearly. It's a great orchestrated campaign all over the world. LGBT, same arguments, same language, everywhere, same progress. Scientific humanism, same books, same teachers. It, it's flown throughout the world. It's a great satanically orchestrated campaign. So it's not a mystery to us, but it is a mystery to the world. If you're an unbeliever, you may have a PhD, you may be a professor of a department, you may be brilliant, but if you're an unbeliever, you don't understand the orchestrated campaign of iniquity. You don't realize, because well, you don't believe in God, and you don't believe in the devil, never enters your mind that the world is subject to a great campaign. It's a complete mystery to you. It's a mystery in other ways too. Let, let me suggest one or two. Take communism with its power and its wickedness and its oppression and so on. And yet, viewed morally, Dare I say it, it was somewhat puritanical. And law and order was maintained. What a mystery. How astonishing. The representative at that time of scientific humanism, absolute atheism, no God seems to fit. And yet, moral restraint and law and order. Yet they, the... the, the Apparatchiks and the leaders themselves were immoral men. So how does that work out? It's a mystery. It's the hand of God. He's decided they won't go down that channel, so law and order restrains them. There's a restraint put upon them. The great mystery of the straining of iniquity to get to this point of throwing off all morals and yet God's got some restraint on humanity. He can't do it. He can't achieve it. And so we see it in Western society. We see the, the ever since uh, Darwin and so on, the throwing off of the yoke of God, and yet people still want law and order. The principle of law and order is left in society. So for the most part, there are still some standards left and some upholding of them. What a mystery. It's not what people really want. And yet, God has written into society a kind of compulsive determination to hold on to some of those things. The mystery of iniquity, struggling to express itself, orchestrated by Satan, and yet all the signs of it being in certain respects held back from reaching a crisis. Total mystery to the unbeliever, these things. But we see it. Now, some people say that what withholds the man of sin is law and order. And in a measure they're right, but it's God who upholds that. Only the Holy Spirit can hold back the man of sin. Well, if I go down, before I look at verse 8, just briefly at verse 9, even him, more about the man of sin, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs, and lying wonders. These are mysterious words to us, we might think. 
his coming, the figurehead, or the climax of whatever it is, scientific humanism, the climax is after the working of Satan with all power. That doesn't mean he has all power. Only God has all power. It means he has power beyond human capability. He has unusual power, but not all power in the strictly literal sense. That's only God. So this figurehead will have strange power and he will use signs and lying wonders. What signs? What will be his signs? Miracles, if you like, if we may call them that, or extraordinary feats which will authenticate him, but only in the eyes of unbelievers. The passage goes on to say, he will not deceive believers. Whatever apparent sign or miracle he does, the believer will see through it. The unbeliever who wants to be deceived will be completely taken in by it. What are these signs and miracles? Well, I don't know but I can only offer you some guesses just to give an idea of what might be. But I don't know. A sign worked by scientific humanism and supremely its figurehead, the man of sin, the kind of sign that will be heralded may be the alleged, supposed, imagined discovery of, say, a homosexual gene which will be paraded and heralded and apparently proved. And the unbeliever will grasp at it. There you are. Biblical morality has been wrong all along. We found, I can't find it at the moment, we found the homosexual gene. The believer will instinctively say, no, you haven't. Doesn't matter what you wave about, you haven't he will be supremely cynical because he believes the book of God, the word of God. I just offer some suggestions. I don't know the answer to my own question. What signs could they do which will convince some and not others? Surely it's along those lines. Perhaps they'll claim to excavate something from the earth which completely disproves the historical integrity of the Bible. Utterly convincing to the unbeliever, the believer believes the book of God. No, there's an explanation for this. This is completely phony. This isn't right. That's the idea. But he'll produce his signs, whatever they are. Signs and lying wonders. And verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, they will be the ones who are deceived, not the believers. But I must come to conclusion, friends. And I come back then to verse 7. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth we have an old-fashioned translation at this point. He who now withholds, is the sense, holds back the man of sin or lawlessness, will withhold until he, the withholder, be taken out of the way, which could equally be translated until the withholder removes of course, the withholder ultimately is God. God removes himself. He doesn't have to be taken as if implying by somebody else out of the way. Until he be taken out of the way. When the Holy Spirit steps aside, then 
the man of sin is free to do his worst. There are some things the Apostle Paul isn't going to mention here. They are taught elsewhere in the Bible. There are some details. The man of sin. It's the end of Satan's little season in the book of Revelation. The two witnesses, the church, the spokesman of the gospel, are able to stand up on their feet once again. And there'll be perhaps a last age revival. There will be preaching. There will be people saved. And Christ will come. The apostle isn't concerned to deal with everything right here. He deals only with this. That the reign of the man of sin will be short lived. And then, verse 8, shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. We've looked at the two preceding events. We've looked at the aims of the man of sin. We've tried to identify, but I think it's easy, it is God, the withholder, the one who holds back the man of sin. We've seen a little glimpse, feebly I know, of what that man of sin will do, energized by Satan. Satan cannot come himself. He is not allowed to become incarnate. And we've noted the coming of Christ. How great are our privileges to see these things, to know what will happen in the last age. How we note it is a doomed world. We're not here to try to improve it, but to preach the gospel to lost sinners. And we get a glimpse of the eternal victory for which we live.